Hello and welcome class to a continuation into chapter 6 where we are learning all about molecular structure. In our previous part we learned how to draw Lewis structures, we learned the conventional or generic kind of like rules to follow step by step in order to draw structures. Well before talking about the uh, really <laughs> like a quote unquote extreme like more complicated cases, there are a couple of terms that we need to talk about before getting there. The terms are resonance, bonding order, and electronegativity. So this part is really kind of like a bridge between these two, uh, like, you know, the first being the really simple Lewis structures, the very last being the more exceptional Lewis structures. In order to understand why we can draw exceptional structures, we need to know what these terms mean. All right, so let's just get started. So Lewis structures are what we call a model. They are not completely perfect. Um, there are plenty of exceptions to them. A really good way to explain this is let's say a molecule is this unicorn. Unicorns do not actually exist, but we can try and explain them to other people by drawing attributes from other creatures that actually do exist. Uh, for instance, like unicorns are, <laughs> for all in, like, I mean, the most basic definition is it's a horse with a horn. So we can try and give this, like, hybridized picture. If you combine a horse with a rhinoceros, right, you have things with four legs, you have little uh, ears, <laughs> They're both like, you know, beasts. <laughs> um, but if you were to try and get a combination of these two, this is what would give you a picture of the unicorn. Now in this analogy, I'm not saying that molecules don't exist, but what I am saying is that we don't have a really good and truly accurate way to draw pictures of what molecules look like. We've never seen them before. We have uh, just, you know, due to, um, constant theoretical and experimental like results and models and pictures like we have a really good idea for the geometry the connectivity like how these molecules are put together but when we try to draw that on 2d paper things kind of fall apart sometimes and so to get a really good uh description for what this perfect molecule looks like like, like how it actually looks in reality we're gonna have to draw on this comparison, we're gonna have to hybridize our description between a horse and a rhinoceros in order to get a really good picture for what this unicorn, this molecule is going to look like. So Lewis structures are like the horse and the rhino. Lewis structure, structure. Sometimes we need to put two Lewis structures together, is what I'm saying, to get a really good picture for what a particular molecule is going to look like. In most cases, Lewis structures in their basic form work just fine, but there are going to be some molecules where we need two or more pictures, put them together, to get a really good idea for how that particular molecule looks. We call those structures resonance structures. If two or more Lewis structures are necessary in combination to better represent the physical or chemical characteristics of a model, these things we call resonance structures. And these resonance structures kind of oscillate back and forth to give us a better picture for what the actual molecule looks like, how it behaves on average. So to see on the actual molecular side of things, not with horses and rhinoceri, but with actual molecules, how do we know when resonance structures are necessary? Well, it becomes obvious when we are following the steps previously outlined in part one's lecture. So if we go through and draw a molecule, there's going to be a point where we're gonna have to make a choice and one picture is not going to be good enough to tell us or show us what this molecule looks like. So for instance, with ozone, this molecule that is O3, no charge, we're gonna follow our rules to draw the Lewis structure of this, and then we'll, you know, along the way, see the fork in the road where we're gonna have to pick one structure or the other. And in reality, the molecule is both. So our valence electron count 
For ozone, each of these oxygens has six valence electrons. There are three of these oxygen or oxygens, giving us 18 valence electrons total. And again, there's no charge on the ozone, so we don't need to modify this count at all. It's just an 18. We are next going to place an oxygen in the middle. It doesn't matter which one, since all of these have the same bonding capacities. There's just going to be one oxygen in the middle, an oxygen on the left, and an oxygen on the right. In drawing the skeletal structure, we're going to place two of the electrons uh, in each pair on either side. So, so far, we have used up four of our electrons, giving us 14 valence electrons left that we still have to place. Our next rule is that we're going to place the electrons on the terminal atoms, so the outer oxygens, to satisfy their octets first. So we're going to place two, four, six electrons on the left, two, four, six electrons on the right. This is a total of 12 additional electrons that we have placed, meaning that there are still two electrons left in the pool. These two electrons, since the outer atoms are now satisfied, we're gonna put right in the middle. This uses up all of the electrons in our pool. We have nothing left over. So as a last check, we must now double check the octet count on each of these atoms in our molecule. So there are two, four, six, eight electrons around the oxygen on the left, two, four, six, eight oxygen or electrons around the oxygen on the right, and two, four, six electrons in the middle. Well, this oxygen in the center does not have a complete octet. Not satisfied. So we're going to have to pull electrons, just one electron pair, from the terminal oxygens. But the problem is that we have two options. We could pull an electron pair from the oxygen on the left, or we could pull an electron pair from the oxygen on the right. Both of these options are equally valid and equally likely to happen, but we only need one pair. So which do we choose? If we choose the option where we're gonna pull the electron pair from the oxygen on the left, our structure is gonna look a little something like this. We'll have the double bond between the two oxygens on the left-hand side, or if we pulled from the electron pair on the right, our double bond would be present on the right-hand side between those two oxygens and a single bond would be present here on the left. If you just look at these two structures on paper, you'd be like, well, they look the exact same. If we were to like rotate them around, these two things would be identical, wouldn't they? The answer there is technically yes in 3D space. So to keep track of what is uh, actually happening here, I'm gonna label this as oxygen A, oxygen B, oxygen C. So the question is, do we actually have a single double bond between oxygen A and B, or do we have a single bond between oxygens A and B? Is the double bond instead between B and C? And yes, if you were to rotate this around in 3D, the structures would behave functionally in the same way, but there's one really big implication that we're missing here. Single bonds and double bonds have different energies and different lengths. If there was truly one double bond and one single bond, regardless of how it's present in geometry, in the structure we would see a short bond and a long bond. These would be observably different. However, when we actually observe ozone out in the wild, when we figured out its structure uh, experimentally through like geometric means, laser light, etc., we actually find that the bond length between our oxygens, which we can see in this picture here on the right, is the exact same. There is no difference. There is not one double bond and one single bond. To go backwards again, before we talk explicitly about what's on this slide, what we actually have occurring here is both of these structures at the exact same time. The double bond that is present this, the double bond that is present between the oxygens that I have labeled as A and B is able to fluctuate. It's able to swap places, let's see, how do I draw this, with the uh, atoms between B and C. The way that this happens is that our lone pair here would jump in 
and then the lone pair jumps out. We have this constant fluctuation in structure. Both of these uh, bonds are actually what we call a one and a half bond. It's very strange to think about, at least if we're trying to picture the molecule statically in 2D. <laughs> If we allow the electrons, though, to be dynamic, if we picture that in our heads, we could totally imagine a situation where the electrons are kind of shuffling all the way to the left and then shuffling back to the right, right? All of these electrons are moving around. So what we need to do instead uh, is, again, just like that rhinoceros and horse combination, we're going to say, well, the actual molecule is somewhere between this perfect or this like static extreme description and this static extreme description. The unicorn, the actual structure for ozone is somewhere in between. And we actually have an oscillation between these two different options. Our actual molecule somewhere in here, if we were to take an average of the picture on the left and an average on the picture on the right, we would be able to get into the center. But there's no one really nice way to draw a Lewis structure with that type of description because the electrons on paper have to stay still. So this is what we call a resonance structure. The combination of our two extreme examples, the one on the left and the two on the right, with this arrow uh, or this like reversible kind of arrow showing that the two are flipping back and forth. This is a combination of resonance structures to give us a better idea for the actual Lewis structure of the molecule. So again, we don't have one single bond, we don't have one double bond, we're somewhere in between these two structures. So if we don't have one double bond and we don't have one single bond, how do we know what bonds we're actually working with? Well, again, the electrons are dynamic, and so the definition of a single bond, a double bond, and a triple bond are assuming that the electrons are not kind of diffuse across the whole molecule. Those definitions are assuming that the electrons are staying between specifically two atomic centers. If we allow the electrons, though, to kind of migrate across the entire molecule, we're going to have to calculate how many electrons are present between two atomic centers on average a different way. This is what we call bond order. This is the number of bonds that are present between two atoms in a given molecule. And it's going, or this definition is going to be the most useful when working with things in resonance. Useful when observing resonance. Right, if we have multiple structures that are kind of flip-flopping back and forth as the electrons move around, we're going to use this definition to get a really nice average for what the bonding order is going to be. The calculation is equal to the number of bonding pairs. So this is how many pairs of electrons are you working with? And we're going to divide that by the number of bonding groups. These are the locations where electrons can be. And so the bonding order for ozone, bonding order is gonna be equal to the number of bonding pairs. We're just gonna go back to the previous slide again since it's explicitly clear how many bonding pairs we have in any one of these structures. We have a total of one, two, three bonding pairs present inside of our structure. And if we look at the structure on the left, we'd find the exact same thing since these two are kind of mirror images of each other. So we're gonna say we have three bonding uh, pairs, three. Next, we're gonna look at the locations where electrons can be. So if we go again back to our structure, it appears as though we have one bonding location on the left and a second bonding location on the right, right? So we have two different locations where these bonding pairs can exist. And so our number of bonding groups is going to be equal to two. This means that the bond order on average across the molecule is a three halves bond or a 1.5. Between the atom, uh, oh man, <laughs> that's a red structure. Let's see, pen color, black, white, green is fine. So between here and here, we would have a 1.5 order bond. 
as well as between the center and the outside, we would have a 1.5 ordered bond. So we don't have a double and a single, but rather somewhere in between on both sides on average. This is how we can explain the bonding distance being the exact same, as well as what we have found experimentally, the bonding energy being the exact same. All right, so here we come to an example slide. Uh, first one really in this entire chapter since everything up until this point we've been working together. So I would like you guys to take kind of a break to decompress and digest what we've been talking about. Draw the resonance structure for the polyatomic ion of carbon or of uh, carbonate. In addition, I would like you then to calculate the bonding order of the molecule on top of that. So please pause the video, approach this problem now. All right, hello and welcome back from the pause. So we are going to approach this together, just compare our work, uh, see if you were able to do this uh, correctly by following my steps as well. So we're gonna start by counting up the total number of valence electrons that we are working with in the carbonate polyatomic ion. So we're going to pay attention to our carbon first, then oxygen and have to take into account this minus two charge. So our carbon has a total of four valence electrons. There are three oxygens total, each of which has six valence electrons uh, around it. And because of this negative two charge, we have two extra electrons, right? The two additional electrons give negative charge. And so if we take four, add it to 16 plus two, this gives us a total of 24 valence electrons that we're gonna have to place in and around this carbonate anion. So we're gonna start uh, with our element that has the highest bonding capacity in the middle. That's gonna be carbon with a bonding capacity of four, carbon in the middle, and we're gonna place our three oxygens around it. Oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. The total number of electrons that we have placed so far is equal to two, four, and six. So we're gonna subtract out six electrons from our pool thus far, giving us 18 electrons that we are still working with. So we're gonna take these 18 electrons per our previously discussed rules and place them around the terminal atoms first. These count as the oxygens. So two, four, six, eight, 10, uh, 12, 14, 16, 18 total electrons placed, minus 18 electrons, and we have none left over. Because there are no valence electrons left over in our pool, we're just gonna have to double check at this point and see if all of our atoms are satisfied. Each of the oxygens should be, since there are two, four, six, eight electrons around each of them. And if we turn our attention to the central carbon, we can see sadly there are only two, four, six electrons. So our carbon in the middle, is not feeling too good. We need one more pair of electrons around it to satisfy its octet. And we can see that there are plenty of locations to pick a lone pair from. We could either pick one lone pair from the oxygen up top, one lone pair from the oxygen on the right, and, or one lone pair from the oxygen on the left, but we can only pick one, right? We can't add too many electrons to carbon. That's also gonna make it unhappy. We need eight electrons to satisfy the octet. So this is where the resonance structures are going to come in to play. We need three different structures to represent these three different options and the corresponding resulting Lewis structure. So if we pick our lone pair from the top, our structure is gonna look a little something like this with a double bond between the oxygen and the carbon up on top and all of the rest of the oxygens still having their lone pairs intact. If we picked it, uh, or if we pick the double bond from the oxygen on the right, we'd have a single bond to the oxygen up on top this time, and the double bond would be on the right. All other lone pairs still intact. Or if we picked the double bond from the oxygen on the left, again, single bond to the oxygen up on top, single bond to the oxygen on right, double bond now present on the left. We've pulled one of the lone pairs in from the oxygen on the left, and all of the other lone pairs are still present. So here we have three different options for where the lone pair can be present. 
and in reality, just like the ozone case, we don't actually end up experimentally seeing one shorter bond distance and two longer bond distances. We actually see each of these three bonds being exactly the same. So what this tells us is that these structures that we have illustrated are in resonance with each other, that the double bond is actually just kind of rotating around the molecule uh, as the electrons dynamically fluctuate. Oh, and before I forget, the last thing we're actually missing on this structure, because this is a polyatomic ion, is to make sure, just as there is a minus two charge on the chemical formula, we have to have a minus two charge on our structure as well. All right, so in combination then, these three structures are the three resonance structures for the carbonate ion. The real structure, how this actually looks, is going to be somewhere in between these, with a bonding order, not that of a single bond or a double bond, but somewhere in between that as the bonds all kind of fluctuate around. Our bonding order for the carbonate ion, we can see that we have one, two, three, four different bonds present, and one, two, three locations where the bonds actually are, right? Three different uh, central points between the atoms where the bonds can exist. This means that our carbonate anion does not contain individual single and double bonds, but rather each bond is identical with a, um, with a magnitude of around one and a third. So the bonding strength is going to be greater than that of a single bond, but less than that of a double bond. And similarly, the bonding distance is going to be shorter than a single, but still longer than a double. We're somewhere around one and a third. All right, the last thing that we need to talk about today is electronegativity. This is somewhat of a big deal and has a lot of implications, not just for the existence of bonds between atoms, but also as we begin to look at the molecule as a whole, the electronegativity of particular atoms is going to define a lot of the molecular characteristics that we are going to continue to talk about for the rest of the chap or for the rest of the semester. So what is electronegativity? This is the measure of the ability of an atom to stabilize negative charge. The definition of electronegativity we can sort of describe as a periodic trend, but it inherently relies on another atom being present. So an, a neutral atom just off on its own doesn't really have electronegativity because the definition of electronegativity is dependent on a chemical bond being present somewhere. The atom has to stabilize a charge coming from something else. So what we can see though in this kind of general periodic trend mock-up is that the elements that have high effective nuclear charges are very good at stabilizing negative charges and therefore have high electronegativities with fluorine being the element that is the most electronegative. We can see that the noble gases here are kind of grayed out for the most part. This is because even though the uh, these atoms have also very high effective nuclear charges, they already have complete octets, and so they're not gonna form bonds. They don't really have good definitions for what their electronegativities are. As we work our way to the left-hand side of the periodic table, where we are observing things that are more metallic, and by definition would prefer to lose electrons, uh, we see that these elements are not very electronegative, right? They have very low electronegativity values. And in fact, the element that is the least electronegative is francium all the way down here in the corner with a very small value of 0.7. All right, so every other element though, kind of in between, is going to have a scaling electronegativity value, right from francium down below, all the way up to fluorine up in the upper right-hand corner. And of course, uh, if we kind of observe a little bit more closely, we can see that there are some exceptions to this trend, and that's perfectly acceptable. I would never expect anyone to memorize all of these values. I will provide them to you when necessary. Um, but noting of the trend is also going to be very useful as we move forward, ex or especially as we are drawing molecular structures using the non-metals up in here, where the trend is much more reliably consistent. All right, so our electronegativity is going to cause 
shifts in the electron balances present between atoms in molecules. So let's start breaking down what happens when we start acknowledging the electronegativity in the molecules that we've been drawing up until this point, even molecules with resonance structures. Well, the first option for what can occur, the first result, is that we end up with something that is known as a non-polar covalent bond. This is a covalent bond in which the electrons are shared evenly. The two atoms that are present inside of the bond equally or pretty appreciably equally want the electrons. They both have approximately equal effective nuclear charges. So they're both gonna be really good at stabilizing negative charge. Numerically, how this is represented is if your electronegativity difference between the two atoms is less than a value of 0.5. Now the 0.5 is not a hard cutoff, but rather we're looking at kind of a gradient of values. If the difference is less than 0.5, we're definitely working with something that is nonpolar. The closer we get to a difference of 0.5, the more and more polar your bond is going to get, which is what we're gonna talk about next. So in these examples, we're looking at a difference that is definitely, definitely shorter than 0.5 and not kind of in this gray zone where the uh, difference or where the cutoff kind of is. All right, so as an example, let's say we are observing a chemical bond between carbon and hydrogen and the bond itself, the electron pair that exists between them is represented by this rope. Now these two atoms exist next to each other in this great game of tug of war. Conventionally, we think of these electrons as being shared in the middle. Again, in reality, they are kind of oscillating back and forth. But the question is, which of these two atoms is better at stabilizing the electrons? Which one is going to have the higher effective nuclear charge? In order to get a really good idea for exactly how disparate the electron pull is, we're gonna go back to our electronegativity table. I'm gonna clean this up a little bit so the numbers are easier to see. We are going to find where carbon and hydrogen are on this table. And we can observe that carbon has a slightly higher electronegative value. Not by much, but it is a little bit higher. This is because our carbon has a greater effective nuclear charge. Again, it's gonna be better at stabilizing the negative electrons in this pair that's being shared back and forth with hydrogen. That's not to say that hydrogen has a, an incredibly low uh, effective nuclear charge or an incredibly low um, electronegativity. It's just slightly less than that of carbon. So if we take these two values though, 2.55 and 2.20, and subtract one from the other, what we get is a value of 0.35. This value is definitely less than 0.5, right? <laughs> By not an incredible amount, but it's different enough that we would say that the bond between carbon and hydrogen is a non-polar bond. Carbon's a little bit better at stabilizing the electron pair, but not so much that the electron pair is not also going to be oscillating back and forth readily with hydrogen. So this is what we call a nonpolar bond. In the great game of tug of war between these two elements, the game is basically a draw. The electrons will oscillate pretty evenly back and forth between these two atomic centers. This is in contrast with a polar covalent bond where the electrons now are going to be unevenly shared. There is going to be most notably one element in the bond that is going to be able to stabilize the electron pair better. This is noted uh, or can be found again, kind of mathematically, if your electronegativity difference is greater than 0.5, but still less than 2.0. This value has a very special meaning. We're gonna talk about that in a brief second. So here we are looking at electronegativity differences that are greater than 0.5. Again, in acknowledgement with our previous conversation, if your electronegativity difference is really close to 0.5, what this means is that you're going to be working with a bond that's like pretty polar for a non-polar bond, but also not very polar when compared to other polar bonds. You're in this kind of gray zone, right? It exists on a gradient. Um, so if your uh, electronegativity difference is pretty close to 0.5, it's perfectly acceptable to say, 
I'm not exactly sure what my electronegativity difference uh, is telling me, but it's going to be somewhere between a polar and a non-polar bond. So let's calculate the polarity of a particular bond as an example, that between oxygen and hydrogen. And we can see in this great game of tug of war between the electron pair that exists between these two or fluctuating in existence between these two, uh, which of the, like the game is a struggle, like hydrogen still wants a bit of the electron pair, but if we return to the electronegativity table again, we can see that oxygen is really electronegative when compared to hydrogen. If we take the electronegativity value of our oxygen, this 3.44, subtract out hydrogen's 2.20, what we find is a difference equal to 1.24. This is definitely greater than 0.5, right? This is nowhere near that gray zone. We have a very polar bond that we are working with here and oxygen with its incredibly high effective nuclear charge is going to be very good at stabilizing this bonding pair as it fluctuates back and forth. What this uh, is going to give us kind of an illustration for then is <laughs> the, the team oxygen is going to be pulling this electron pair towards it, meaning that the electron pair is going to hover around the oxygen more frequently than it's gonna go back to our hydrogen. It must still oscillate between the hydrogen. We know this because the bond is still present, right? The hydrogen's sticking around, but the electron pair is going to be more stabilized by the oxygen. So it's going to spend way more time over here than it is over by the hydrogen. This is going to give us a uh, buildup of electron charge on the oxygen slightly more than the hydrogen. The big implication is that we're going to have a little bit of a uh, negative charge, a tiny negative pull uh, or a tiny, a tiny negative charge present on the oxygen due to the pull of electrons more towards it. The way that we represent this is with a lowercase delta. This symbolizes a little change. It's not a complete change, it's a tiny change with a negative charge. This means partially negative charge building up on our oxygen. The hydrogen in contrast is going to have a partially positive charge on it. Again, lowercase delta with a positive symbol means that we have a partially positive charge on the hydrogen as a result of the oxygen pulling the electron density towards it. The greater implications of this partial negative and partial positive we'll be seeing more as we start looking at bonds inside of molecules on the whole. For right now, we're just talking about the individual bonds themselves. All right, so we've looked at the nonpolar bond, we've looked at the polar bond, but what is, let's return to this, the electronegativity difference greater than two. What could this mean? Well, if a nonpolar bond means that electrons are evenly shared and the polar bond means that electrons are unevenly shared, the greater the electronegativity difference, the greater the pull of electrons from one place to another. And in the most extreme sense, we are going to be working with what is known, and we have been discussing in the past, or we have discussed in the past, an ionic bond. This exists because electrons have been completely transferred from one atom to another. In the great game of tug of war between a non-metal, like chlorine, and a metal, like sodium, the sodium says, listen man, I don't even want my one valence electron. If I get rid of this, I'm gonna be perfectly stable, so here you go, you can just have it. We can recognize ionic bonds though by measuring electronegativity differences, just like the nonpolar and polar bonds. The ionic bonds are symbolized by an electronegativity difference being greater than two. This means that one of the elements is so good at stabilizing the negative charge, as opposed to an element that's so bad <laughs> at stabilizing a negative charge that the uh, element that's bad at maintaining a negative charge is just gonna give the electron up. There is no covalent bond, the electrons completely transfer, and instead we call this an ionic bond. To represent this, let's go back to the electronegativity chart one more time and compare the elements of sodium and chlorine. Even just 
with the color gradient. We can see that this chlorine on the far right hand side of the periodic table is this like bright yellow color. The sodium on the far left hand side of the periodic table is this pink color. This huge difference in the gradient telling us that there must be a large difference between the electronegativity values. And if we actually calculate the difference, 3.16 from our chlorine minus the 0.93 from our sodium gives us a total electronegativity difference of 2.23. This is definitely greater than two, meaning that we are definitely working with uh, something that we would consider to be an ionic bond. All right, so one last example problem for the day. I would like you guys to calculate, or not calculate, to draw the Lewis structure for chloroform, CCl4. Once you have this structure drawn, uh, right, for some good practice, just drawing more Lewis structures, before also looking at the electronegativity table, I would like you to predict whether the bonds in this compound are going to be nonpolar bonds or if they're going to be polar bonds, just based off of the location of carbon and chlorine on the periodic table. Are they close enough that you think that they would be similar enough that you have a nonpolar bond, or are they far enough away where you think that the electronegativity values are going to be different enough to give you a polar bond? Once you have your prediction, then please go back to the electronegativity table and kind of confirm what your expectations were, right? So we're gonna hypothesize an outcome and then we're actually going to go double check what the outcome is. Welcome back from the pause. Let us go through, we're gonna draw this structure. We're gonna predict the bonding uh, <laughs> um, like polarity. And then we're gonna actually calculate what the electronegativity difference is between carbon and chlorine. All right, so first and foremost, we have to figure out what the valence electron count is in this molecule. That way we know how many electrons we're actually working with that we can take and then place back inside of the molecule. Well, our carbon has a total of four valence electrons and there are four chlorines each with seven valence electrons. I just almost started writing chlorine there. Um, the total then of four plus four times seven gives us a total of 32 valence electrons. All right, so in actually starting to draw the molecule then, we're gonna pick out the element that has the greatest bonding capacity. This will again be our carbon, and we're gonna surround this carbon with four chlorines. Chlorine, 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 and chlorine. This means that we have placed a total of two, four, six, eight electrons around the atom, or around the molecule so far, giving us a total of 24 valence electrons left. The 24 valence electrons we're going to add to the terminal chlorines first. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. All 24 electrons have been added, giving us none left over. Uh, so let's double check that everything's satisfied. Our chlorine has two, four, six, eight electrons around it, and that will be true for the rest of the chlorines. They all look the exact same. And our carbon in the middle also has two, four, six, eight electrons around it, so everything is perfectly satisfied. This is a stable molecule. No reason to be pushing electrons around to make double bonds, triple bonds, whatever. There's no need for it. Uh, similarly, there are no charges here that we need to like add or subtract, so this is perfectly satisfied and our structure is finished. All right, next up, we are going to try and predict whether or not the compound is going to be, uh, or the bonds in the compound are going to be nonpolar or polar. Well, on the periodic table, both carbon and chlorine are present in the P block. So they're both on the right hand side of the periodic table. Carbon is up here and our chlorine is down here. The question is, is this difference enough to make the individual bonds uh, polar? Well, first and foremost, let's predict which of these two is going to have a higher effective nuclear charge. As we saw back in chapter four, the effective nuclear charge really increases as we move from left to right on the periodic table, meaning that chlorine is going to have the higher effective nuclear charge. 
if the bonds end up being polar, we would expect chlorine to have the higher electronegativity and pull the bond away from carbon towards it. Again, the kind of remaining question is, is this distance though on the periodic table actually enough to make a polar bond? And you know what, let's just say for all intents and purposes, we're gonna predict yes. Let's say that there is going to be a polar bond here. And also as predicted, our effective nuclear charge increasing from left to right means that the chlorine is going to be the more electronegative. So let's uh, represent this by saying each of these bonds are being pulled away from the carbon. So there's a little bit of a positive residual charge on the carbon and the electrons are being pulled towards the chlorine. We're gonna do that for each of these bonds here. That is going to represent in our Lewis structure a difference or a polarity in our bond in one direction away from carbon and towards chlorine. All right, well, let's go back to our actual table to confirm this hypothesis or maybe even refute the hypothesis. When we go back to our electronegativity table, and again, I'm gonna clean this up a little bit, we need to pick out our chlorine and our carbon. Well, we can see based off of our prediction uh, that we made using our effective nuclear charge difference, chlorine actually does have a higher electronegativity. The question is, is this difference enough to make a, an actual polar bond? Well, chlorine's electronegativity difference is 3.16, or electronegativity value, sorry, is 3.16, and we're gonna calculate a difference from carbon's electronegativity value. The difference between 3.16 and 2.55 is equal to 0.61. Now on the ultimate scale of bond polarity, uh, the value of 0.61 is not incredibly polar, but it is still greater than 0.5, and it's greater enough to say, yeah, this is a polar bond. The electron a uh, pair between carbon and chlorine is better stabilized by chlorine. And so the Lewis structure, going back forward again, that we have drawn here, where each of the bonds are being pulled away from carbon and more towards the chlorine, is a perfectly accurate way to try and represent or draw uh, where the electron pairs are inside of this structure. Chlorine's going to be holding the electron pair most of the time as it oscillates between it and the carbon. Overall, the structure though is very stable. C, uh, Cl4 is a readily abundant molecule that we can like synthesize and make and store uh, you know, in our world. So even though the bonds are polar, this doesn't mean necessarily that the structure is unstable. It just means that the chlorines are better at stabilizing the bonds themselves. And, uh, All right, and with that, we are going to wrap up today's lecture where we have talked about what it means to be electronegative and polar in terms of a bond. And similarly, we have talked about what it means for these bonds to actually oscillate and jostle and be shared across the entire molecule at times, and how we know when to expect these molecules to arise. Uh, so here are some section review problems. We can see that we're definitely working out of order in the text in chapter six, where uh, electronegativity and polarity are in section two of chapter five, resonance is in section five of, or sorry, uh, chapter words. Electronegativity and polarity are discussed in section two of chapter six, and resonance is discussed in section five of chapter six. So we're definitely working out of order here. Um, my goal though is to help the lecture ultimately to kind of flow a little bit better. So we're laying the groundwork and then explaining the more, uh, let's say, exceptional Lewis cases as we go. All right, but that is the end of today's lecture. So if you have homework, please do your homework. And until next time, class is dismissed. <laughs>